Welcome to the first episode of season two of the Sourcing Challenge show. Technically, this is episode 43, so welcome to that. I am your host, Mark Lundgren. In this episode, I sat down with Erin Matthews from Illinois in uh, US and talked to her about her, her start. Um, so as always, uh, I started off by asking Erin how she got into sourcing. Yeah, so I would say that my first entry into anything related to talent acquisition was actually not on the uh, recruitment of employees. I actually, uh, one of my first jobs out of college was student recruitment for a uh, college that specialized in education for adults. Mm -hmm. um, so I still had to do a lot of the same type of tasks like intake calls and um, understanding what it was the students wanted and where they were and where they wanted to be. So I think it was kind of a natural transition to go into talent acquisition after being exposed in in that sort of uh, realm of, you know, getting people through the door, making sure that they're right, the right fit, qualifying them and helping them as best as possible. So it wasn't that far of a jump to go to talent acquisition from that. But I would say that my first real job in talent acquisition was probably one of the more interesting ones. I, uh, I started off with a experiential marketing agency, which means that they put on marketing events for okay. certain brands through events. So, um, you know, maybe if you've been to uh, an event like uh, Lollapalooza or um, <laughs> any big music festival, you'll usually see a lot of promo girls handing out samples of beverages or giving you free samples of a product those are either brand ambassadors or promo models. So those were the people that I had to source. And that was a unique challenge before. No, you don't have to send a point. picture at all. No, 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 it's fine. Just. <laughs> oh, that was a whole topic in and of itself. Um, yeah, there were, there were certain regulations that we had to get around because we could not ask for headshots. No. Um, but we could send them a higher view where, you know, we would ask them questions. I have never felt so creepy in recruiting that I than I had in, <laughs> when I was doing a role like that. Um, but, you know, the, another big challenge was a lot of times these gigs were just one weekend of work. So how do you ensure that someone cares enough to even show up for that? So um, that, was, uh, that was very interesting, and it was a very reactive form of recruiting. But eventually I transitioned into healthcare, um, you know, which was a, a, a great, you know, longer experience that I had with that. And uh, Eventually, in my healthcare role, um, my my role went from about forty percent sourcing, uh, you know, with sixty percent recruiting to pretty much ninety percent full cycle recruiting. And I, it was then that I realized, wow, I really missed the sourcing part of this. And uh, you know, I had actually um, that's that's kind of when I got things started with getting involved in communities like SourceCon. Um, I had actually asked my employer for years to send me to SourceCon when I was working in healthcare. And they kept saying, oh, not this year, not this year, not this year. And then finally, one day we had a big team meeting. This was a team of about 50, 60 recruiters. And they said, okay, the people that scored at the top of the scorecard this quarter, you know, the, the top three, uh, we've got a, we're, we're actually going to have an incentive this time for being on top of the scorecard. And they said, these three people are going to SourceCon. Ooh, I was I, not in the three. Hmm. So, so I left that meeting a little bit seething because I had asked to go for years. And, yeah. you know. And I've at least set the quarter before so that it's a real incentive. It's like, if you are in the top three. Exactly, exactly. So after that, I had, um, I, I got really mad. And then I decided to channel my anger into something. <laughs> and I said, okay, how can I make this happen for myself rather than waiting on someone else to make it happen for me? So I came to my boss after talking with some of the people on the SourceCon Facebook group who were immensely helpful, even though they didn't even know me. <laughs> and I, I came to my boss and I said, I found out that you can blog your way to SourceCon. And I said, here's the deal. I'm going with those three people to SourceCon. I will take vacation time if I have to, and I will pay my own way. And yeah. then he said, all right, well, I guess you care enough about your development that, you know, you want to go bad enough. So I'm okay with that. And uh, don't worry about travel. We will pay for your mm. travel since yeah. you've got the ticket price covered. And uh, the funny thing is uh, once my uh, blog started coming out, I suddenly started getting a lot of job offers elsewhere. And by the time SourceCon rolled around, I didn't go with that company. <laughs> so... <laughs> 
so it, it was a really uh, interesting way that things transpired. And it was kind of a whirlwind after that because a full year later after my first SourceCon, which was this past fall, I ended up speaking at SourceCon. Mm -hmm. So I never really thought that in the course of a year, I would go from a complete unknown in the sourcing community to actually speaking at a big conference like that. Um, and, you know, I, I got so much more out of it. Um, I, I gained a lot of mentors that I have learned pretty much most of what I know um, from them. So, you know, people like Greg Hawks, Brian Fink, Steve Levy, Dean DaCosta, um, all of those big names. I was, you know, very excited at how eager and willing they are to help people that are brand new to this. And, you know, most recently I've been trying to turn around and do the same. Um, I've got a couple of friends that have wanted to get into sourcing, but don't quite know where to start. So I, I think that I, I've talked to a couple of people that don't really know where to start when it comes to mentoring a brand new sourcer. Yeah. I mean, that's that one of the, one of the reasons I wanted to do this show as well, because it's, we all got started somewhere. And I think most of us were lucky to find something or someone to either mentor or just to kind of point us in the right direction. Um, I, I had a very, some, some early mentors as well, and I still have mentors that I work with. So, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing. But, you know, if you sit in the, if you're the only one in the company who kind of cares about sourcing or, you know, one of the few people in your country, where do you go? Uh, you, know, you Google things and you end up finding the same kind of things. But like, how do you, you know, how do you kind of get into it? And it's part of what I wanted to do, to just give people, point them in the right direction and, yeah, show them that even the, the, the people that you think are the, the big gurus and things like that are, we're like, we're all the same. Um, you know, you, you speak to Dean, uh, you speak to Steve Levy, you, you speak to, you know, Glenn Cathy. We all got started somewhere and everybody wants to give back. So most of the time it's just about reaching out to them and saying, look, I have a question. Can you help me? Absolutely. And, you know, I think that you might be surprised that no matter where you are in your sourcing level, you might be able to teach something even to the most experienced person there is. And um, that's kind of where I, I got my start with creating my own content, creating my own methods. Um, and my first source con, I attended a round table with Greg Hawks. And in my mind, this is the guy that knows everything. He's done everything. He's tried everything. And I asked him, have you ever sourced on the platform Reddit? And he said, uh, no, I'm familiar with Reddit, but I'm really kind of scared of sourcing on there. So I've never really dove into <laughs> it. So I wish I could help you, but I actually don't know that much about it. And, I, and then the light bulb went on for me and I'm like, oh, if Greg Hawks hasn't tried it, maybe I could figure it out. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it kind of felt like an uncharted territory. That was an opportunity for me to kind of try and decode and see if I could, you know, give back and share something with the community. And it turned out to be, you know, something way bigger than I ever imagined that it would be. And, you know, I've given several presentations about it too. And I even have a uh, sourcing toolbox specifically for Reddit that I still maintain to this day. Um, but I love that platform because it's one big hackathon. You'd be amazed at what you can figure out about people, even though they don't give you their name or anything. You know, whatever they disclose about themselves, they're all little crumbs of information. And it's, it's, it's probably not the most time efficient way to source, but it's the most fun. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's OSINT in its purest form. Like, you, you get snippets, and yeah, there's probably a million different ways you could get the same information faster. But, you know, when, what's the fun of it? Um, yeah, I, I still think, you, like, I know you're, you're one of the only ones in the community that I know of that have even tried to touch Reddit. Because it's, 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 it's a bit similar to when uh, you had a couple of people, it's like, this is how you source on Tinder and Grindr and, like, a couple of years ago. <laughs> That never really took off. Um, I know some people still like in certain industries that kind of doing dating sites works to, for some people. Uh, Reddit is one of those things where it's like you can get burned really badly if you do it wrong. Um, and it's, exactly. it's, not, it's not like LinkedIn where you're just like, ah, you know, I'll, I'll, you know they'll forget in a couple of weeks. Um, like they, if, if you're in the wrong community and, and you piss somebody off, then you're not coming back there. Because um, it's just like, it's a very tight knit community. So, and I know, a lot of what you teach people and talk to them about is like, this isn't a quick fix. It's not no. where you set up a profile and then, you know, you got 500 connections within a week and, and you get going. It's, it's something you have to nurture over time, uh, give a lot to the community before you ever even try to ask for anything. Exactly. Um, 
And I think that a lot of people still don't understand that. I, ha I still have people reach out to me a lot saying, um, what do I do now? Uh, okay, uh, how do I source on, on Reddit? And I'm like, hold on, hold on, hold on. I will not help you source on Reddit until you watch my first webinar because I go very in depth into how to actually interact with the Reddit community. Because recruiters already have a bad name for spamming everything. I don't want us to have that, uh, that reputation even more so on Reddit. Um, but you know, the fact of the matter is, sure, you may be able to find more candidates quicker, but it's really a treasure trove of some people that have gone away from the usual platforms like, like LinkedIn and job, job boards. Um, and it's, it's really a fantastic way to find some communities that are really passionate about what they do as well. There are uh, dozens and dozens of developer communities where they're all just showing off their work that they're proud of. And I think that it says something really special about someone that after work, they do more side projects to get better at their skills. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of rare to find someone like that just from a LinkedIn profile. Um, and it's, but, I mean, it's similar to why we source on Meetup because it's people exactly. who are self-identifying, but Meetup, it tends still to be very kind of generalistic terms that like you still want to have enough people to actually show up at an event where, yeah, you have a subreddit with five people. That's the five experts of that very specific, bizarre niche in the world. Um, but that's fine. But you'll find them there. Yeah, absolutely. And platforms like this are where natural language search is going to be your best <laughs> friend as well. You know, that's that's kind of, uh, you know, the, the puzzles that I really had to solve when I was first digging into Oh, you mean no bullying? Like you can't just, you know, you get the same string every time? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's a, it, it's a lot of typing in like, check out my GitHub, or I built this tool here, or email me here. You know, it's simple things like that that you, you know, you, you just can't overthink it. Um, and then there are some communities that are actually somewhat welcoming to recruiters, but you have to know which ones those are. Um, for example, the React.js subreddit is probably one of the best run communities that I've ever seen, and it's grown significantly within the last year. When I first discovered it about a year ago, the, uh, the member uh, count was at like 60,000. Now it's almost to 200,000. And they, they even have a mega thread every month where they allow recruiters to post job openings. Yeah. So I think it's great that they manage it, that, you know, the recruiters aren't going to come on there and spam individual users. They have a dedicated place for it. And then they even have a monthly list of who's available. So mm -hmm. when I was searching for front-end developers, every month, my first thing was going down the list of those people, seeing where they are. And most of them would disclose their contact information, their GitHub profiles. So I, I think that it's great when you allow people to opt in that way as yeah. well, when they can come out of the shadows of their Reddit profile. So... But it, it also adds an interesting layer when you actually reach out to these people in real life. I've even had some people that have a little bit of panic once I find them because they're, they're going through their mind like, did I post anything controversial on Reddit when I thought I was anonymous? Like right, you've seen everything now. So yeah. <laughs> no, that, yeah. I mean, that's what people have with Facebook when they think you've seen the pictures of their kids. Yeah, we have, but you know, I'm not going to use that against you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and sometimes I'll, I'll be like, I'll, I'll kind of even the playing field and I'll be like, well, this is who I am on Reddit. So you can read through all my stuff. That's fine. So, you know, of course, I'm definitely more mindful now about what I, <laughs> about what I write since I've personally been able to figure out other people's things. And then it made me think, oh, I'm not as anonymous as I think I'm here. <laughs> and like, like me, you are one of the ones that I know have embraced video a lot. Um, especially yes. in outreach. Tell me kind of, you know, some of the um, learnings you've had from that. Yeah, I've, uh, I've definitely learned that there's still not a lot of recruiters doing it. You know, we've, we've said over and over, use video, use video. And there's still a very small portion of the population of people that will actually do it, even if you walk them through every single step of how to. And this was actually my topic for SourceCon Atlanta this past fall. And I still have people reach out to me saying, I loved your presentation. One of these days I'm going to do a video. And I, was, I, I always ask... <laughs> Why not make that day today? Today's the best day, especially now. You're probably sitting at home anyway. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, I was really proud earlier this week, though. Someone reached out to me on the SourceCon board about putting out a video, how to do that. You know, is it a good idea? And I was like, yeah, yeah, you should totally do it. And I said, tag me on LinkedIn if you do one, and I'll share it. I'll like it and all of that. 
And she actually did it. I was so proud of her and she did a great job. And it didn't even have to be high production value. No. It was just putting yourself out there and standing out in front of the crowd. So it was. A it was actually, I just, we all have that. We probably have webcams. We have like every, you can get all the tools for free. We have a phone. Most of us have, you know, 4K video recorders in our phone. So like, there's no real excuse anymore. And those highly polished employer branding videos are less and less attractive to people. Um, I, I've seen the same, especially like these weeks. I have friends from, from back in Denmark as well that just, because we're all stuck at home, have had to use video more and, and, and are getting out there. You can see they're sitting in their kitchen, and, but they're, like, they're still working. So I, okay, how do I reach people? Um, whereas, you know, if I normally do a meetup or something like that, this is a way like, all right, let's try it out. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that with the employer branding videos that are a little bit more polished, they're great for your careers page or for, you know, sponsored LinkedIn postings and things like that. But when you're reaching out directly to a candidate, they see right through that. Yeah. They, they almost want it to be a little bit more gritty and know that it was you that made the video. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes you can do something as stereotypical as writing their name on a piece of paper and sending the video because then they're like, oh, okay, wow, I, I'm really not just a name on a, and there you go. There you go. <laughs> um, you know, it just, it shows you that you care a little bit more, you know, um, especially with people in high need positions like in IT. Um, yeah. You know, I, I'm noticing more and more in some of their profiles that they're even adding code words that you have to have in your email for them to respond because <laughs> actually they filter out emails from recruiters. So that's, that kind of makes looking at the profile so much more important and the outreach that you use that much more important as I mean, well. I'm following a lot of the GitHub um, repositories for um, filters for, from yes. recruiters, UK, US, you know, where just where it's crowdsourced from developers who are saying, all right, these people have now, you know, they've sent me 10 emails in the last week. I've told them to take me off. I'm still getting emails. Block this domain. If you like in, in your, you're getting blacklisted and that's, that's what's yeah. going to happen. And more and more, like, I like that. I see that from corporate domains. And it's like, yeah, if you, if you don't, if you don't look like something that's not spam, you will be treated as such. And, and just because you think you have a, a funny headline, that's just not going to be enough if you send the same thing to 200 people. Exactly. And I think that even the funny headlines are starting to lose their luster as well. You know, I used to be a big fan of the tech stack puns and things like that. They're funny and everything. But now I, I've sort of changed my approach to um, actually writing lines of code as my subject line. Mm -hmm. I, I ended up taking a Python course a couple of weeks ago through General Assembly. And now I use a code written in Python for my subject line. And I've gotten a really overwhelmingly positive response to that. Um, you know, because it's, you're making an effort to speak their language rather than, you know, making a pun that anybody could without... <laughs> Without having any kind of knowledge of the program. But there's only that many people who've gone to the same university as you as well and like, you know, support the same teams. It's like, at some point you're just going to get, yeah. I've seen it even using personalized videos and very like specific type of personalized videos. Um, because I use a video that's embedded in the email, it's not everybody who wants to click on it because they're like, exactly. Yeah, it's a, so yeah, just explaining what it is. It's like, yes, I have a clickable picture. Um, but I also get the whole URL, no matter how ugly that looks to where the, the video is located. Because it's like, look, like this is where it's, you know, this is the landing page. I'm not going to try to make it pretty because I know you're not going to click on it if I do. Exactly. Exactly. So, and I think that our messaging is always going to be evolving based on the needs of, you know, whatever comes up. Um, you know, some, no method that I use now is going to work forever. And no. I think that that's another thing to recognize as a sourcer is that to be you know, a top level sorcerer, you have to be willing to be dynamic all the time. It can be very easy to get stuck in the same ways um, that you've always done things. I, from time to time, I'm still guilty of that, but you know, don't ever forget to shake it up every once in a while. Try something you haven't done. And that's still easy because 99% of the industry is on LinkedIn every day. Um, so like, you know, people like you that go out and you find your own niche with Reddit, um, you're going to be the queen of that for many, many years because nobody, it's going to take some time before they actually build up a, a decent reputation in the, in, 
in like Reddit in general, but also like, well, LinkedIn works. Why would I change it? It's like, yeah, keep doing that. I'm happy because that means we can keep charging lots of money to do nothing really special from what they do just by not going to LinkedIn as the first instance. Yeah. And, you know, I do still use platforms like LinkedIn, Hire Tool, and Seekout as my first line of sourcing. You know, there's no reason that you shouldn't grab the low hanging fruit just because mm -hmm. it's not a cool way to find things. I, <laughs> I end up going to Reddit when um, I've tried everything and I'm not getting responses. And then I'm like, you know, maybe I'll, I'll try a different audience that maybe isn't getting messaged as often. Absolutely. And what's your tool stack look like? What's your, like, we all have our kind of go-to, um, what, what does yours look like? Uh, well, very first of all, Boolean. Mm -hmm. I, I always do Boolean first. Um, and then I have custom search engines that I use as well. So I have custom search engines for LinkedIn. Um, so I use the LinkedIn X-Ray more often than probably any tool that I have. Um, and then I, I, of course, build lists through Seekout and Hire Tool, and then I go through that method. And then I start going into more granular methods, uh, whether that's Reddit or site searches of other social sites that are not meant for job searching. Um, I actually have a custom search engine for Meetup as well. That one has uh, served me well in a couple of situations as well. Where do you kind of see yourself going with this? Like where, is there something new that you kind of looking at? It's like, oh, this is the next thing that I, I want to look into. Because you seem to be some, somebody like me, like, okay, I got that down now. What's my kind of next thing that I want to look into that I think would be interesting? Oh, I wish I knew. I keep thinking, oh, I should, I should probably get in, involved in the younger social media groups. Uh, that just this morning, my team was talking about TikTok and I'm like, oh, this is going to be Snapchat all over again. I don't know if I want to get into that. <laughs> I know that I should though. Maybe maybe I should just take the dive and do that. But I, I deleted Snapchat years ago because I just can't stand the face filters. But you know. <laughs> no, it, for, for me it's like the return on investment for me from a sourcing point of view just wasn't there. Like yeah, it's good entertainment, but you know I can go to YouTube and do the same thing. I don't I don't need that that rapid. Yeah, as soon as Instagram Stories came out, they kind of died for anybody older than fifteen. Um, and that's that's the kind of thing you're gonna see like okay how can we use this and a lot of it is like from a marketing point of view absolutely I could use a lot of these things from a sourcing point of view yeah I'm still trying to figure out Twitter so you know I'm not gonna start going into TikTok yeah yeah and I think that a lot of the existing social media that I have there's still a lot I haven't uncovered I, I believe that there's a lot more potential with Instagram than what I've personally uncovered because obviously people are tagging their posts with all kinds of different things. And there's actually a lot of programmers on Instagram and a lot of channels that they follow. So, you know, I, that could be some, you know, a, an untapped treasure trove of candidates. I, d I don't even know. But, um, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and for somebody starting out, what would you, you know, if, if you, like you say, you have friends who want to get into sourcing, what do you kind of recommend for them? Where do they start? What do they read? Who do they follow? You know, how do they get started? Uh, well, I usually have a, a master list of, you know, the people that have taught me a lot within mm -hmm. the sourcing community that I usually tell them, you know, reach out to them, you know, send them a connection and request on LinkedIn, even with just a little message saying, hey, just following some people in this industry. I'm trying to learn a lot myself. You know, thanks for accepting. And, you know, you'd be surprised at how many people will reach back out and ask, oh, well, what have you learned so far? What yeah. would you like to learn? And I think that getting embedded in the community is very helpful right off the bat. And then after that, um, tried and true, you have to know Boolean because it's going to help you with everything else. And um, I, I think that it's kind of cool showing that to a new sourcer for the very first time. And then sometimes they come back to you and say like, hey, I didn't use this for talent acquisition, but I needed a, a shirt that was specifically this color that, and then I did a site search on this really big shopping website and I found it here. And then, you know, they start thinking about every single website in a different way. Yeah. Once you show them how, how, it, how easy it is to make the internet a smaller place with different methods. Mm -hmm. um, but my friend that I'm, I'm most recently sourcing, uh, helping source, he, um, He's not currently in talent acquisition and he's currently looking for a role right now, but we, I think we've gotten him to a really good place where some experienced sourcers aren't even there yet. Um, we've had bi-weekly, you know, just like meetups where I'll, I'll demo a couple of things mm -hmm. and 
he actually ended up paying for SourceCon Academy out of his own pocket just because oh, he wow. wanted to yeah. get the most comprehensive, um, uh, you know, overview of recruiting and sourcing as he could. So, and he graduated uh, a week ago. So that's been kind of fantastic. So I have high hopes that eventually we'll find him his uh, foot in the door role for that. But um, it has been uh, really interesting trying to help other people learn what I do. And I think the biggest realization that you have is how much you have to break everything down. Yeah. So many things are just second nature to us after we do it every day. Um, something as simple as keyboard commands, you know, the, things like that, that you just have to break down to a granular level before they get the hang of things. But it's still very exciting finding someone that wants to learn. Uh, I mean, like search, search operators, it's just like it's second nature to most of us. You're like, oh, I have to explain to you why I use site instead of <laughs> in your, you know, things like that. You're like, I don't, yeah, you don't think about that. Yeah, yeah. And I, it's, it's still very exciting and rewarding for me finding someone that really wants to mm -hmm. learn too, though. And when I've gone to any kind of conferences, you see two types of people. There's the people where you can tell their company's making them go to this. <laughs> and oh, they, yes. they just kind of go through the motions when it comes to sourcing or full cycle recruiting. And then there's, there's the people that may be overwhelmed by all of the information, <laughs> but you see their faces light up and you can see the wheels turning and you can see them getting inspired. So when you find a person like that, it's hard to not want to mentor them and, and you know, keep that excitement going. Absolutely. And how, like you, when you're switching from medical to, to more tech, how did you kind of, you know, how did you do that switch? You know, if people, because I see that a lot, uh, a lot of companies looking for tech sourcers, tech recruiters, uh, a lot of recruiters want to get into it, but they always like, well, I don't know tech. Um, what did you do and uh, what would you advise on to people who either make the switch from something else to tech or, you know, just want to get into tech recruiting? Uh, tech recruiting for me was actually a really big learning curve. I would say it was a solid year before I actually felt comfortable doing it. And I, I think that a big part of the struggle is nowadays software engineering can mean so many different things. You know, if, if you asked me what a software engineer does 20 years ago, you know, maybe they knew uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, the big three, and then Java on the back end. Now we've got data engineers, we've got infrastructure engineers, we have network engineers, cybersecurity, front end, back end, and it's just very, it's very segmented now. And I think understanding those segments is where people get very confused. And if you don't understand those either, you can offend most of the candidates. You know, if you don't have exactly the right niche or don't understand their career trajectory, um, that's where you get in trouble. Yeah. So for me, things really started clicking when I, I tried to get a little bit of hands-on experience myself. And I still maintain that you don't need to know how to program no. to be a tech sourcer, but I really advise everyone, take a couple of hours, try a little bit of this, at least have a base level understanding of what all of these programming languages do. And even something as simple as being able to correctly create a subject line in Python that shows enough effort to a lot of candidates that they're gonna wanna interact with you. And I've even found that sometimes when I share updates about you know, what programming language I'm dabbling in this week, if I post that on LinkedIn or Instagram or Facebook, the programmers start coming to me and then they wanna help. Yeah. So that's been an interesting experience as well. But I would say that one of the resources that helped me the most would be the YouTube channel, uh, Traversy Media. Mm -hmm. the quality of that content is something I'd be willing to pay for, but it's free. Mm -hmm. um, so he explains everything from, you know, what's a front end language? What is a back end language? What's an API and what does it do? And um, even from there, he has like hour and a half programming intro courses for everything from HTML, CSS, JavaScript. You can learn almost anything from this guy. So I would highly recommend that if you, if you need an absolute crash course in recruiting for IT. Yeah, you're based up in, in the, the, the cold, cold north, uh, Illinois. Um, for, for people who maybe uh, they have a job where they have to start either recruiting in Chicago or anywhere kind of around there, um, and they're not from that area, it, what's the kind of difference in, in your state or in the region? What do people have to think about? Uh, or you know, stupid people like me from Europe who all of a sudden have roles that we have to start looking for in, in, in the region as well. Like, 
is there any differences or what's the kind of best way to get in? Is there anything we should think about with that? I think it depends. I don't really recruit in the Chicago area anymore because my company is actually based out of the Washington, D.C. area. So I'm recruiting a lot of uh, cleared developers. So mm -hmm. I do have to understand a little bit about what's going on locally there. Um, but, you know, when I was sourcing locally, um, especially for front end engineers, I knew what all of the conventions were, what all of the meetups were, which companies were using React, which ones were not. So, um, you know, I, a lot of times it's understanding the tech stack of other companies locally mm -hmm. if, it, if, you know, if you're going to search in the right places. And it was easy to call out the lies if someone said, oh, yeah, I've been working with React for five years. And I'm like, uh, your company doesn't use React. I can tell just by looking behind the source code of the page. So... <laughs> so what now? Um, so yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, the, there's a lot to understand yeah. locally about anything and, um, you know. No, but it's good, it's good advice. I mean, actually going into details, especially if you are lucky enough to be fairly based on one specific region, it's like that's the kind of granularity you can go into. Um, if yeah. you like me and you know, you're a gypsy when it comes to anything kind of work-wise and one, one day I'm in, I'm sourcing for one country and one day a completely different one, then yeah, it gets slightly more different, uh, difficult. And it, it just means a lot more research all the time, uh, which is I think what most people miss, that it's not just about making lists and reaching out to people. Uh, it's about doing a lot of that background research. It's like, okay, and now I have a completely new role in the country I haven't sourced for yet. You know, can I find them locally? That's going to take me some time. If not locally, who would be willing to relocate to that specific location? You know, where would they come from? And then do the same kind of checks on, on yeah, companies from whatever country that is. Yeah, and I think that you gain a lot of knowledge just by diving in and starting because the candidates are going to tell you a lot of yeah. that insight as well. You know, um, I'm, I'm especially having a, a challenging situation now finding electrical engineers in the Palo Alto area. No. Because they, they either work for, <laughs> they either already work for Apple or, you know. But well, they're not going to live in the Palo Alto area because it's too expensive if you're not exactly. working for Apple. So, yeah. Exactly. And then you try to get people to relocate to Palo Alto and they're like, well, I live in Utah, so you need to double my pay if you want me to move there. So, yeah. um, I've, I've kind of had to go to a method of uh, going to other really expensive cities and saying, hey, you want to move to this other expensive it's city cheaper. here? <laughs> and that's, <laughs> well, it's not, but it's, no. about, but, you know, I, I'm like, oh, you're used to high rent. Why don't you come work here? Yeah. It's at least warmer, you know? Exactly. That's what we're using in Spain as well. So, yeah, that, that works. Some other countries that can be a bit harder, but yeah, you always, there's always something you can find that is going to, it's either the commute to work, uh, there's going to be something, it's the family's going to be happier, whatever it is. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that um, a lot of people um, don't even realize that you can find some of this information from Glassdoor reviews as mm -hmm. well. You can do a site search targeted uh, specifically to the benefits that are maybe better at your company, but not at others. So then conversely, you can just do a uh, glass door site search, finding people complaining about those things at their companies. And then that kind of gets the wheel spinning to target those other companies that don't have it as good. And if you have way too much information uh, and you're with one of the bigger companies, well, now it doesn't uh, go to the app called blind. Um, it's, it's an anonymous employee sharing information from mainly tech companies. Uh, most of them on, yeah, the West Coast. Uh, asking anything from, I'm interviewing with Apple. I'm currently at Microsoft. This is my, this is my, you know, this is the seniority level I have. What can I expect in terms of salary? And somebody from Apple is going to tell you that. But it's a big rabbit hole. You can, you can easily get lost a couple of days just reading different threads. Uh, but like anything in terms of, what is it actually like working in different companies? People working in those companies are going to share uh, because it's anonymous. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, it's it's not as structured as um, anything else we kind of used to. Uh, I mean, it was an app to begin with. Now you can you can use your once you log in. Like they have to verify that you're with whatever company you say you're with. So you get one email to verify that. Um, but then that's all you're going to ever get from them. But then you're verified and then you use that kind of like if you switch your mobile phone like like I did, then you kind of lost that. Um, but you can use that to log into the web version as well. And that's just a treasure trove of, you know, information that for the most part should be confidential, but definitely isn't. 
Um, and especially if you're working with tech companies in the Bay Area or Seattle, like you can get, but again, it's a very big rabbit hole and set aside a couple of days because you can easily get lost in a lot of these tracks, but similar kind of information, but just because it's less publicly accessible, um, you get a lot of information there. Yeah, I feel like the more anonymous people are, the more honest they are. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, that's what you kind of had with, with Reddit to begin with, yes. that 4chan and things like that. And uh, people think they're anonymous when they go to Glassdoor. You've had a couple of cases where not so much, uh, which is all they're going to get out of that is people not being honest anymore. Um, so, yeah, that's what it is. Look. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a challenge that I uh, came across when I was trying to solicit more Glassdoor reviews when I was uh, working at my previous company, um, because we really needed to uh, not necessarily raise our score, but we had to get more insightful reviews up there. You know, there's a difference between giving a review saying this place sucks, don't work here, <laughs> saying, you know, the hours are longer, it's, you know, it's yeah. difficult, sometimes employees are burnt out. I think that's better to have that type of review where you tell, you know, tell us why our company sucks. Don't just, you know, say something inflammatory and leave. Um, but, you know, a lot of employees, when I had roundtables explaining to them why it's important that they tell their story, whether good, bad, or indifferent on Glassdoor, they were all afraid of being identified. And I said, well, first off, don't put your job title if you're afraid of that. Don't put the location that you work. Because if I had, you know, left a review as talent sourcer in Downers Grove, Guess what? that would have immediately, <laughs> that would have immediately out myself because yeah. I was the only one of me. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's just about being smart in that situation. Look, here, Aaron, if uh, people want to follow you um, and yeah, see what new exciting things you come up with that you can, can share with them, uh, where can they best do that? So you can find me on LinkedIn and the uh, identifying part of my URL is Aaron Matthew Sorcer. And then on Twitter, my handle is just Matthew Aaron. And that's Matthew with one T, no <laughs> S, just Matthew. <laughs> Brilliant. Look, thank you very much. Um, I look forward to meeting you soon again. You as well. Thank you for having me on. If you like this episode, please consider sharing it or any of the other episodes with a friend or a colleague who might be interested as well. And consider subscribing to the channel, which will help us meet more people and grow the community.